Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second talk in the summer series webinars. Our speaker today is Dr. Robert Horton. He's a senior lecturer in medieval history at the University of Winchester. His research addresses networks of politics and power in Italy in the central Middle Ages, but increasingly concerns engagement with the medieval world and medievalism through computer and tabletop games. His monograph, the Middle Ages in Computer Games is set for publication later this year and is currently co-editing the Rutledge Companions to History in Computer Games with Kate Cook, Chris Kemschel. Recently edited volumes include Playing the Crusades, The Middle Ages in Modern Culture with Carl Alvestad, Teaching the Middle Ages through Modern Games and Playing the Middle Ages. Robert is also the organizational lead of the annual Middle Ages in Modern Games, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and yes, sir, I've just been reminded just how much I've ended up doing with, with computer games in the Middle Ages. Um, there's almost certainly something in there. Um, can I just ask, is it possible for me to share my screen? I've got a few slides set up. Sure. Sorry, I should, should have sorted this before, before we got started. That's my fault. It should work now. Sorry. Ooh. Been doing this for what five years now? Still having problems. There we go. There we go. So apologies for that. So thank you, thank you again, Aya and Sophie, um, for, for having me, and apologies for the, for the delays there. So as, as Aya's highlighted, today I'm going to be talking about medieval strategy games, strategy games set in the Middle Ages, um, and how a few of these games, Crusader Kings Free in particular, do something a bit different with their representation of the period in comparison to other strategy games. The quote I've taken from the quote I've taken from the, the title today, Real Strategy Requires Cunning. This was one of the key advertising taglines for Crusader Kings Free. The game, developed by Paradox Interactive, was released in 2020 and has received a large number of iterative revisions and expansions. It places you in the role of a medieval ruler in a simulacrum of the period and shares many core characteristics with the broader strategy genre of rulership simulators. But the advertising pitch as a real as, as a real strategy game, which requires cunning rather than management of spreadsheets, aims to emphasize the difference between Crusader Kings and its competitors. The blurb on the game's Steam page continues in this vein, using and includes such rhetoric as your legacy awaits, choose your noble house and lead your dynasty to greatness in a Middle Ages epic that spans generations. Crusader Kings Free features the widely acclaimed marriage of immersive grand strategy and deep dramatic medieval roleplay. Take command of your house and expand your dynasty through a meticulously researched Middle Ages. Your death is only a footnote as your lineage continues with playable heirs, either planned or not. These are all very effective and emotive statements and tying quite neatly with common perceptions of the Middle Ages. The blurb suggests a world where family is more important than state, where conflict is ubiquitous, is chivalric, and where apocalyptic forces wait just around the corner. The developers promise to transport players into this world. But the advertising pitch makes some big claims, but most importantly presents the Middle Ages as hugely alien and vastly different from the modern world. This sort of claim to be doing something unusual in a game is far from uncommon. This is standard advertising pitch for all genres of computer game. Although it's possibly more necessary for Paradox Interactive, the creators of Crusader Kings, to distinguish the game from their fairly substantial range of historical strategy series. If Paradox had pulled off their claim, 
with regards to crusader things, then this is really exciting from both a pedagogical and a nerdy perspective. Strategy games, often termed conceptual simulations within, within the scholarship, can have a huge impact on their audience's understanding of history. The Civilization series is the go-to example for this. Indeed, the majority of academic literature about strategy games relates to this long-running series. In this genre, players guide their polity through a vast span of history, more than 6,000 years in the case of civilization, coming into competition with a range of other nations in economic, scientific, and especially military spheres. These games depict history through their mechanics. They build models of historical structures and allow the player to explore them through play. As such, they can be excellent tools for exploring cause and effect. A huge range of literature has been produced detailing the use of these games for teaching and research purposes, in both theory and in practice. But strategy games almost always present a view of history that's homogenous, that follows the same core pattern, regardless of time or place. These games are all about growth, progress and expansion. They're all about monolithic nation states, which are eternal and fundamentally unchanging. They sideline social, cultural, and religious issues in favor of economic, diplomatic, and above all, military activity. They almost always take modern America, or at least the modern West, as the norm and the only possible pathway of historical change. They tend to be colonialist and imperialist as at the core of their play as a result. There are various reasons for these trends, but most notably, the developers of these games are primarily white and American or European, and their presumed audience comes from the same demographic. These developers follow what they know and often recreate the core principles of earlier iterations of the series. In some respects, many recently released strategy games are still following the same model of history represented in the original civilization back in 1991. As a result, strategy games are often really bad at representing historical periods, regions, and cultures which do not comply with their, these core systems, essentially which don't match well with modern America. Civilizations and peoples who don't match the model are either arrays or included as entities which are almost identical to America. This has a particularly jarring effect when these games include colonized peoples. Civilization has turned free, Maori, Congolese, and many others into palette-swapped versions of European settler states. Suffice to say, this is not very useful for teaching purposes and can be actively harmful in a social setting. These trends also have a substantial impact on the representation of the Middle Ages in strategy games. We end up with representations of medieval kingdoms which are functionally identical to modern democracies or ancient empires. While these limitations are less immediately problematic, they nevertheless undermine the utility of strategy games for teaching the Middle Ages. As a result, Paradox's claim about Crusader Kings is quite bold, especially as a lot of games which claim the same sort of thing end up producing mechanics which are functionally similar to those of civilization. So can we believe the hype around Crusader Kings? Certainly the game looks the part. It's got a vast map covering much of Afro-Eurasia, and although its claims to research are contested in some areas, there's a lot of detail on display here. What's important to me, though, is that there are a lot of things that the game does which are distinct from the more standard approach we see in Civilization and in any number of other games. I'm going to talk about three of these differences. The focus on dynastic rulership, the extensive, if abstract, religious mechanics, and the use of systems to promote a vision of the Dark Ages. Many of these elements can be observed in other medievalist games, but they're most clearly visible within Crusader Kings. So, perhaps the biggest distinction of Crusader Kings is the game's dynastic approach. This is certainly core to the claims made by Paradox, to remember back to the advertising blurb I read at the start of the presentation. This is very much one of the big claims, one of the big selling points of the game, as far as its developers are concerned. And one of the big limitations of many ludic representations of medieval rulership are the depictions of political systems. 
Strategy games tend to present factions as nation states. They have a fixed identity, are synonymous with their population, and generally have limited scope for internal political strife beyond occasional minor disorder. The player acts as the nation, not the ruler, as a result. Each branch of government can be relied upon to act following the command of the player as part of a well-oiled geopolitical machine. While the rulers of different civilizations may have different strengths and weaknesses, these are just as much caricatures of their empire as they are of the rulers themselves. Furthermore, the rulers of civilization remain static throughout the game. Your empire will be ruled by the same figure across 6,000 odd year time span, with the same goals throughout. Furthermore, the core mechanics remain the same throughout the game. The main difference between a, Mon a Bronze Age settlement and a modern metropolis is simply its scale. They have the same modes of food production, resource production, and income generation. This sort of thing doesn't really work for the kingdoms of medieval Europe, or for most political systems throughout history, for that matter. There's not really any scope within civilization to get into the dynastic struggles of the Middle Ages or the complex polity which accompanied them within and between kingdoms. Instead, if these issues are noted at all, it is usually through limitations or penalties to production. Hence, the early civilization games imposed a fairly hefty corruption penalty on empires ruled by a medieval monarchy, which reduced their economic and scientific output. Aside from these penalties, though, being a king of a medieval kingdom was mechanically the same as being a president or dictator of a modern nation state. The deeply personal aspect and often fragmentary nature of medieval rulership is often lost as a result. Crusader Kings takes a very different approach to medieval rulership. There are a few aspects to note here, but perhaps most fundamentally, in Crusader Kings, you play as a series of members of a dynasty rather than as a nation. At the start of the game, you select a ruler with particular advantages and disadvantages, just as in civilization. However, unlike in civilization, when that ruler dies, you take control of their heir, typically the firstborn son or the eldest surviving son, a figure with their own strengths and weaknesses. Immediately, we see a step away from the totemic immortal rulers typical to strategy games. You play as the ruler rather than the nation. These dynasties are wholly separable from their kingdoms. Over the course of the game, players may inherit, usurp, conquer, or create a range of new kingdoms, either as independent entities ruled over by different members of the dynasty, or as a single polity united by a personal union in the form of the dynastic head. If a dynasty dies out, then their kingdom will typically survive. A different dynasty will rise to power. Likewise, the destruction or loss of a kingdom does not necessarily spell the end of a dynasty or the end of the game. Play may continue as a different branch of the family within a different part of the world. The handy example up on the screen here with the Jumena dynasty ruling over a number of different kingdoms in northern Iberia at the start of the game. As a consequence of this dynastic focus, Kingdoms and other polities avert the monolithic nation states typically seen in strategy games. By default, each kingdom retains its own laws, customs, and identity, even when ruled by a single figure. Changing these fundamental values is an arduous and a largely unrewarding process. This stands in stark contrast with civilization and most other strategy games, where integration of conquered territory is often immediately and largely, uh, sorry, it's often immediate and is largely painless. Cities may undergo a brief period of unrest, but inhabitants immediately identify as members of their conqueror's nation. This retention of division between kingdoms can lead to complex internal political situations in Crusader kings, with a ruler possessing substantially different rights and powers within their different lands. These separate identities also provide the basis for the redivision of kingdoms, whether relatively peacefully through inheritance divisions or more violently through rebellion, usurpation, or conquest. These political systems are supported for a fairly deep model of a feudal pyramid populated by tens of thousands of different dynasties. Unlike most strategy games, playable characters are not restricted to the rulers of independent realms. 
Crusader Kings introduces a social model of six layers, incorporating emperors above kings, over dukes, over counts, above barons, and finally at base of a cluster of unlanded characters. Every figure within this pyramid from the count upwards is available to play. Clergy, burghers, and other figures are shoehorned in at appropriate levels. This vast cast of around half a million characters are distinct and autonomous individuals who may ascend or descend throughout the system and often possess wide-ranging familial connections. This provides a much deeper representation of society, or at least the upper levels of society and politics that is provided, than is provided through the couple of dozen independent actors possible within the civilization goals. Most of a player's interactions will typically be with figures within their own realm, placing a much greater emphasis on internal diplomacy. Likewise, although a king's vassals may notionally open fealty, they each have their own goals and autonomy, and will often act against their rulers' interests. Again, this is a far cry from the always loyal nations and omnipotent rulers of most strategy games. The complex politics facilitated by this model are given extra depth through the array of personal relationships and interactions provided by Crusader Kings. As is typical within strategy games, each actor within the game has an opinion of every other actor, which determines their likelihood of accepting proposals, most typically alliances, but also trade packs, or acting against each other, normally by going to war. However, in Crusader Kings, not only are these actors no longer states, instead they're individuals, but these opinions are modified by a vast range of different conditions. Two characters of the same family will typically like each other better, while those of different cultures or faiths may be less well disposed. Characters may be friends, lovers, or enemies with a corresponding impact on their opinions. A plethora of interactions and events may sway opinions. Feasts, hunts, weddings, and tournaments may create mutual appreciation amongst participants, although incidents at these events may provoke enmity instead. The details provided for each character in Crusader Kings are much more comprehensive than those provided within most strategy games, and individual characters may have very different traits. Each character in Crusader Kings has a character sheet which would not look out of place within a role-playing game. These sheets quantify the character's basic abilities, including martial, stewardship, diplomacy, intrigue, and learning. But more importantly, these character sheets also present a number of character traits. These can reflect the character's personality, compare the diligent, just, and humble ruler with the lazy, ambitious, and arbitrary usurper, for example. Their education or their physical condition can also be represented amongst these traits alongside other elements. Each of these traits has an impact on the character's abilities, but also influences their relations with other figures. In general, characters tend to like other characters with similar traits. Several of these traits also influence a character's goals and likely behavior. Ambitious characters are much more likely to rebel or make demands from their ruler than content characters, for example, while ventral characters are much more likely to launch schemes against their rivals than forgiving characters. These diverse and complex characters have a particular impact when it comes to dynastic rulership. So each of these figures, which will rule as successively within the dynasty can, uh, can have a huge impact on the style of rulership that they are most effective at conducting. As each character may have vastly different abilities, it is entirely possible for a brave, ambitious warmonger to be succeeded by a learned, pious theologian. The relative abilities of these characters mean that continuing a strategy of military expansion will be considerably less, less successful than this more erudite but less martial heir. Instead, a more peaceful approach focus on, focusing on rebuilding the dynasty's reputation at home or abroad may be more effective for a generation. These differences between rulers within a dynasty are made even more stark through the use of hard and soft restrictions on the actions available to different characters. Some actions within the game require that a character has particular traits. Wrathful characters, for example, have additional options when it comes to punishing prisoners whereas diligent characters may devote extra resources to de the development of their capital and other cities. 
sadistic characters, meanwhile, may launch hostile schemes up to and including murder against their own children. Characters who do not possess these traits may not take these actions, denying them to the player for the duration of their rule, and rather enforcing a different manner of play as different characters come to power. Softer limitations are imposed through the stress mechanics. Various factors cause characters to gain or lose stress over the course of their lives, with higher levels of stress having a negative impact on their health and fertility, and potentially leading to the acquisition of undesirable traits, or even to the death or abdication of the character. The sorts of actions which cause stress are closely tied to character traits. Hence, ambitious characters become stressed if they release vassals or grant away their lands, while craven characters gain stress if they join a war. Not only do the abilities of successive rulers within a dynasty vary, the game strongly encourages players to act in character, to play as the individual, not as the state. So Crusader Kings does a pretty decent job, I think, of exploring the dynastic and secular aspects of the medieval world. But what about the sacral side of the Middle Ages? Most strategy games sideline religion. The civilization games have all included background references to faith and spirituality, mainly in the form of buildings like temples and cathedrals, and military units such as crusaders and fanatics. These representations, though, were Generic, generic and typically were not tied to any particular faith or creed. More recent entries in the series have included specific religions, such as Christianity, Islam, Zoroastrianism, and various others, but these faiths remain effectively interchangeable, at least in mechanical terms, and the representation is generally shallow. It's perfectly possible for Protestantism to embrace papal primacy, for example. Games in general have been reluctant to engage with religion in any meaningful depth for various reasons, including largely to avoid controversy which could damage sales. This aversion to including religion within computer games may make commercial sense, but it doesn't work for representations of the Middle Ages. In the popular mindset, the church is everywhere within the Middle Ages, and to a substantial extent, this is a valid trope. As a result, strategy games with medieval settings have often taken steps to highlight the prominence of religious institutions in their worlds. But this is usually still quite shallow. The medieval Total War games, for example, included Christian and Muslim factions, which functioned effectively identically. They included Crusades and Jihad, which served similar, similar functions and shared a lot of similar mechanics. They also included the Papal States, ruled over by the Pope which functioned almost identically to secular kingdoms and often included allowing the Pope the ability to lead armies and in a couple of cases to get married. Crusader Kings includes a fairly detailed representation of the church and religion more generally. At its most basic, this is an extension of the dynastic and interpersonal models of the game. Each character has a piety characteristic, reflecting their moral standing within their faith. This is raised or lowered by the character's learning skill and some of the actions they may take over the course of the game. It's also modified by the personality traits. Several character traits such as cynicism, lust and sloth are defined as sins and reduce a character's piety, while others such as chastity and patience are characterized as virtues with a corresponding boost to piety. Piety Im impacts the relationship between characters, but is also embedded within several game mechanics. Religious organizations exist alongside the game's feudal pyramid, with a model of the merry medieval church running parallel to the secular systems of the game. The Pope and bishops may intervene or interfere with kingdoms for a, for a range of supportive or confrontational actions or events. Religious activities from pilgrimage to crusade can have a substantial impact on the broader world and form a key part of rulership. Religion also has an impact on a kingdom's laws and the, more, and, the sorry, and the permissible personal interactions between characters, most notably with issues around marriage and fidelity. This all provides quite a deep model of the church within Crusader Kings, with particular tenets, sins, virtues, and doctrines and structures in place. 
there's a lot more detail here than is present within civilization or most other strategy games. And this representation is reasonably well connected to the reality of the pyramid. It's also worth noting that it's not only Catholicism or Western Christianity which receives this deeper consideration. A huge range of Christian denominations and heresies are depicted within the day, alongside an equally impressive range of other faiths, including various sects of Islam, Buddhism, Paganism, and Zoroastrianism. More recent expansions, such as Fate of Iberia, provided a more detailed and nuanced consideration of the interactions between faiths. Finally today then, Crusader Kings takes a bit of a different approach to progress on the Dark Ages from that which is more commonly found in strategy games. The Dark Ages and other periods which are typically characterized around the fall of empires, the destruction of civilization and so forth, have traditionally been tricky for strategy games to portray. This is so much the case that most simply ignore it. The issue here is that games are all about progress. Players expect to be constantly conquering, advancing, developing their territories, and so forth. It's also generally accepted that taking a player's progress away is bad design. This is fair enough, but it does mean that the Middle Ages and strategy games don't look anything like the Dark Ages of popular imagination. In civilization, the medieval period is just part of the broader model of systematic Whiggish mark of progress sat between the ancient and modern world. There's no backsliding in technological terms or social terms. Every technology grants new buildings, military units, or other abilities, which are invariably superior to their counterparts in the ancient world. Technologies are acquired systematically through research along a rigid and predestined technology tree, following the choices made by the player as ruler. To be fair, avoiding the repetition of tropes around the Dark Ages isn't necessarily a bad thing. However, it does stand in stark contrast with the popular imagination when it comes to the Middle Ages. More importantly though, the Whiggish March of Progress model isn't much better as a historical explanation. The model of directed and centralized scientific research presented in civilization and other strategy games doesn't really fit with the medieval reality. Likewise, the constant improvement of society and expansion of borders common to strategy games doesn't really fit in the Middle Ages. Crusader Kings retains some of the, the issues encountered with civilization here, but it does take some steps in promising directions. Science is now termed innovation, but aside from this rebranding, and more importantly than this rebranding, a number of mechanics present technological change in a more organic manner. The tech tree has been flattened, so no technology requires research of an earlier innovation. So there's no strictly mandated route of progress throughout the period. Acquisition of technology is based on culture rather than polity, so it's entirely possible for different areas of a kingdom to have reached different innovations. Progress towards each innovation occurs simultaneously and semi-randomly, and can get boosted by exposure to technologies from neighboring cultures. Although the cultural head of a culture, essentially the most powerful character with that culture, is able to pick a fascination which boosts research in a particular area, this is still much more limited than the research selection and direction of civilization. And the impact of this fascination, although it's significant, isn't as absolute, and also depends on the learning skill of the ruler to a substantial extent. As a result of all of this, we get a much more organic view of technological change within Crusader Kings, with no predetermined path, a piecemeal spread of technology, and limited central direction. Technology is still presented as progress throughout the game, but it's much more of a meander than a march. Beyond this, Crusader Kings takes a number of steps to counter the constant expansion motif of strategy games in general. This manifests through the division of lands through inheritance in the earlier part of the game. Many of the kingdoms have succession laws based on the partition of territory between all legitimate male children, which can routinely knock back any expansionist ambitions. There are also limitations on how swiftly territory can be acquired and how much can be controlled directly. Beyond a handful of provinces, a ruler must rely on vassals to govern his lands, 
something made possible through the Davis feudal pyramid and emphasis on personal relationships. This is coupled with some events over the course of the game which can border on the apocalyptic and easily undermine large realms. Many of, the, many of these rely on barbarian invasions, including the Vikings and Magyars, through to the Seljuk Turks and then the Mongols, who will conquer vast swathes of territory and lay waste to an even greater area, setting back the expansion and development of existing kingdoms. More recently, though, mechanics around disease have been revised, and now the Black Death and other plagues can completely decimate regions and indeed the entire world. These diseases, the Black Death in particular, spread across the map rapidly and are likely to kill any character who catch it, while knocking down the development of any province which reflect it. These apocalyptic disasters can drastically alter the geopolitical situation and provide new opportunities or challenges for players. They also make a very different representation, one where Wiggish progress can be reversed. To sum up then, Crusader Kings Free does a lot to counter standard depictions of the Middle Ages in strategy games. It presents dynastic rulership with a heavy religious bent and alleviates the march of progress narrative common to strategy games in general. This is, to a large extent, the result of the more personal game mechanics of Crusader Kings and its accompanying role-playing elements. It's worth noting that Crusader Kings is not alone. We see some similar approaches to the Middle Ages within several other games. Knights of Honor and the upcoming Field of Glory Kingdoms, for example, really emphasize the dynastic manner of rulership within the period. Total War Attila has done a lot with the Dark Age or the anti-progression motif that I've discussed today. Games outside the strategy genre have also done a lot of interesting things within and around medieval rulership. The first-person rulership of Mountain Blade, for example, or the casual and precarious monarchy provided within the Reigns series of games. A similar approach, a similar approach can and has been applied elsewhere. Paradox have done interesting things with the early modern period in Europa Universalis, the Victorian era in Victoria, and Roman world in Imperator Rome. Each of these games fundamentally alter the core mechanics common to strategy games in order to provide a more distinct representation of their periods. Beyond this, games like Senkala Dev's Parang, Laup, Maritime Warfare provide different regional perspectives, in this case, 16th century Indonesia while others, such as As Far As The Eye, take the point of view of nomadic groups in a more abstract manner. It's also important to emphasize that there are limitations to what Crusader Kings and other games have done. These games are still Eurocentric. Their mechanics still restrict several activities key to the medieval period. Religious issues in particular are often very abstract. There's no way of recreating the investiture contest, anti-popes, and much else within the religious mechanics of Crusader Kings. There's also a lot more that can be done to press for role-playing as characters rather than reverting to world conquests. Nevertheless, it's really important to look at what these games are doing. It's really not enough to focus only on civilization as a way of engaging with the past and with the Middle Ages through computer games. Crusader Kings is leading on different genres of game to create a more interesting image of the Middle Ages. We've already seen that the influence of role-playing games and survival games, and recent, ex um, recent expansions to Crusader Kings have experimented with itinerant rulership, and it looks like we're getting an expansion to play as an unlanded character, to play a rulership sim where you are not the ruler. Ultimately, although its claims are still sometimes overblown, Crusader Kings is something different from standard issue strategy games and represents part of the growing trend that we need to be aware of. Looking at the various directions the genre is heading in, it's becoming increasingly clear that studying real strategy games will require a very cunning plan indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Houghton. Uh, it was a very interesting, insightful presentation. Thank you so much.